Uh, Go to Mark's Gospel, Mark chapter 10. We're just continuing going uh, verse by verse. And Lord, we do pray that you would speak to us this morning, challenge us through your word, and God, as an act of worship, we open our hearts to receive what your word says. Lord, we don't want to put our own ideas on you, Lord. So speak to us and challenge us in Jesus' name. Amen. There was a couple that uh, went out to dinner for their 50th wedding anniversary, and as they're driving home, uh, the lady notices a tear in her husband's eye, and he was like, oh, are you sentimental after celebrating 50 years? And he said, no, I was thinking that uh, before we got married, I remember your father threatened me with a shotgun and said he'd throw me in jail for 50 years if I didn't marry you, and tomorrow I would have been a free man. So we're looking at some marriage uh, ideas this morning. Jesus is continuing to teach uh, God's heart uh, for being a disciple, but specifically today about uh, what it means for marriage and family. You know, I just want to say at the outset, uh, I'm not, most of my Christian life and things about God, I've learned the hard way, uh, and I'm not exactly the, the best example of the way that you should do things. And that comes definitely not with marriage, but uh, I'm trying to keep myself out of the doghouse this morning. So now my wife and I did elope when we were, uh, when I was to just turn 22 and she was 21. We went through a drive-thru uh, wedding and had a wedding in Miami. And uh, not exactly for my young, you know, uh, <laughs> for the young people, the way you want to do things, but she did say it was the best decision I've ever made. So <laughs> just want to throw that out there. But let's get into the word this morning. So I'm saying that because Jesus sets a very high standard, right? We want to look at what God's heart is for family and, you know, not just look, well, he did this. Perhaps your girl eloped, so. (laughs) I'm talking to my kids, right? All right, let's get into it. Mark chapter 10, verse 1. And he left there and went to the region of Judea and beyond the Jordan and crowds gathered to him again. And as was his custom, he taught them. So here this morning, Jesus is continuing to teach. And one of the things that Jesus drills down on here is is marriage and family. And he goes on, and the Pharisees came up in order to test him and asked him, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife? He answered them, what did Moses command you? They said, Moses allowed a man to write a certificate of divorce and to send her away. And Jesus said to them, because of your hardness of heart, notice that phrase, because of your hardness of heart, he wrote you that commandment. So he's thinking of the specific commandment in Deuteronomy chapter 24, where Moses did make a provision for uh, marriages to end in divorce, for men to divorce their spouses. And one of the primary reasons was to protect the spouse, protect the wife specifically. But we understand this idea, um, I mean, even today, we don't, you know, a lot of times a, a couple will get married, they will have, um, you know, the wife will sacrifice her career to raise family, um, and the laws are in place for alimony, right, and child support for, specifically for the wife, uh, typically, and the kids, So we understand this idea. Just because there's a law about it doesn't mean it's necessarily God's heart. So there's a very subtle thing going on here also that I want to point out. And one is the Pharisees are thinking about God in the sense of that he's some kind of mean judge sitting there and they're trying to just skate by and see what they can get away with. Right? They're looking at God in that sense. They're like, okay, did God say we could do this? Okay, what's the letter of the law, and what can we get away with? And they're thinking of God in this way of, you know, if they obey all these rules, that somehow God's going to bless them. And I think for all of us, we need to be careful. God desires that we have a relationship with Him, right? That we're not just thinking about God in this, as He's some kind of mean dad, and we're trying to see what we can get away with. We need to love God with all of our hearts. That's the greatest commandment. God has called us to love Him. He wants to have this father-to-child relationship uh, with uh, us and with you. 
But the Pharisees had this misguided, rigid view of God. And Jesus opposed the Pharisees. He did this on many different occasions. He opposed them in the sense the Pharisees were saying, well, you have to wash your hands before you get married. Uh, did I really say that? <laughs> before you get married, you've got to wash your hands. Before you eat, you've got to wash your hands. And they're saying, well, you can get a divorce. And Jesus is saying, no, it's okay. You don't have to go through these ceremonial traditions before you eat. And also, you're saying it's okay to get divorced. And Jesus is saying, no, it's got, not God's plan for you to get a divorce. It's never, I mean, uh, that gets not God's heart from the beginning. That's what he's saying here. God's will for marriage is that it's a lifelong covenant where two people, a man and a woman, get married, they leave their father and mother, they cleave together and make the sacred covenant for lifelong, for their life, and that they're fruitful and multiply. So Jesus, going on here, continues to explain God's heart for marriage. Verse 6, it says, But from the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife. The King James says, cleave to his wife. And the two shall become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. What therefore God has joined together, let man not separate. And when you go to a wedding and you do a wedding, it's before God, right? You have a Christian wedding with a a, a pastor, and we invite God's presence. So when you get married, you get married under God, before God. And there is a seriousness here. God's desire is never divorce. God hates divorce. What God has brought together, man should not separate. That's been his design from the beginning. There's, you're to come together, be friends together. I've always loved Driscoll's definition of marriage. It's a sanctifying friendship. And Satan, the prince of the power of the air, always wants to destroy families. He wants to destroy marriages, cause divorce. But here Jesus is saying there's two genders, male and female. They're to form families, and those families are to stay together till they die. Families are to be led by men who don't harden their hearts and walk away from their family. And it's not a coincidence here that he talks about children Uh, And he goes on here uh, in a minute. In the house, the disciples asked him, and he said to them, whoever divorces his wife, verse 11, and marries another, commits adultery against her. And if she divorces her husband and marries another, she commits adultery. And they were bringing children to him, and that that he might touch them. And the disciples rebuked him. But when Jesus saw it, he was indignant and said to them, let the children come to me. Do not hinder them, for such to, the, to, to such belongs the kingdom of God. It's amazing how hard-headed these disciples are. It's just painted this picture. They're constantly learning. And just like us, we're constantly learning more about God. And Jesus is rebuking them. They're saying that the kids, they're like pushing kids away. It's kind of a, crazy to think. They're pushing kids away from Jesus, and they're rebuked. Uh, by Jesus. And truly I say to you, verse 15, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a child shall not enter it. And he took them in his arms and blessed them and laying his hands on them. So this idea of receiving the kingdom uh, like a child is not just innocence, but the fact that they are weak. Jesus paints both the disciples and the Pharisees in the same light here. Very interesting. On the one hand, the disciples, they're pushing aside the weak children and saying they don't matter. And the Pharisees are pushing aside their wives and children and saying they don't matter. And Jesus' heart is that he cherishes families. He cherishes wives. Women should be cherished. And he's speaking particularly to men here. Women should be cherished and children should be cherished. A couple of thoughts here on divorce before we get into God's heart for family. A couple of thoughts here on marriage and family. Uh, One is, in Matthew's account, in Matthew chapter 19, there's a very similar conversation recorded for us. Jesus says this about a divorce, that you should not just give your uh, wife a certificate of divorce and leave her. 
And in Matthew chapter 19, verse 10, the disciples said, if this is the situation between husband and wife, it's better not to marry. Did you know they said that? They're thinking, wait a minute, what? I can't just divorce my wife because I want to? And they actually said, it's better not to marry. Paul said a similar thing in 1 Corinthians. He said, if you get married, you will face much trouble in this life. And he actually encouraged single people that because a single person could remain fully devoted to God, he said, I wish that all men were as I am, which is single. And he challenges people to embrace their singleness and say, serve God with all of your heart, right? But those who get married will face trouble, and it will not be easy. Marriage is not easy. Mine is, but yours probably isn't. Another situation is, you know, even the 9 a.m. was laughing more than you guys. I don't know why y'all are so serious this morning. What's going on? Another situation, there are situations where divorce happens, right? There's separation that happens. Mark's gospel doesn't include the exception clause, but there are exceptions. Jesus said in Matthew, except for adultery. And I realize abuse and, uh, is a case for separation. We don't want to put ourselves in illegal or violent situations. There are times where divorce happens, but it's certainly not God's heart. And then third, there are some marriages where there's a believer and an unbeliever. Maybe that's your situation right now. The Bible says very clearly that if the unbeliever leaves, let him go. You're not bound in such circumstances. That's 1 Corinthians 7, 15. The idea is that a believer, because a believer understands this life is not all that there is, and a believer has a relationship with Christ, they're willing to suffer uh, for the will of God, and it's the will of God not to get a divorce, so the believer stays and the unbeliever many times has just a view of this life, they want to be happy, and they just leave. So in that case, when you're a Christian and the unbeliever leaves, let them go. You're not bound in such circumstances. But God's heart for marriage and family. So let's think about it for a minute. We're going to want to lay out five big ideas here. And then we'll go a little bit deeper into a few ideas into people groups. But God's heart for marriage and family, if you want to take notes, number one is that a marriage is one male and one female. It doesn't matter what the law says in our own nation. God's heart is that it's one male and one female. You know, we, we love uh, everyone. We're not hateful towards anyone that may have a different opinion. Same-sex attracted people, we love them, we have hopes for them. But God's heart for marriage, a holy matrimony, is one male and one female with distinct roles, right? There's a difference. And we, as a church, we hold this view of complementarian, that, that male and female, they're equal in God's sight, but we complement one another. There's differences biologically between a male and a female. We looked uh, deeper into this at a, a, in the Make, Make Us One series, if you want to check it out, but... The, hel- the husband is the head of the family. If you want to turn over to Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5, we see these different roles. Doesn't mean that genders aren't equal, but they are unique. God has called husbands to lead the family, to be the head of the family. And it says, uh, Ephesians 5 verse 22. Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord, for the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, his body, and is himself Savior. Now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit to their husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word. So that he might present the church to himself in splendor, without spot or wrinkle or any such thing. That she might be holy and without blemish. In the same way, husbands should love their wives. That's agape love. Agape love your wife as their own body. He who loves his wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes it and cherishes it, just as Christ does the church. Because we are members of his body. 
Therefore, a man, uh, a man shall leave his father and mother, hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. The mystery is profound, and I'm saying that it refers to Christ and the church. So a marriage is to image this relationship between Christ and the church. A couple more verses. However, let each one of you love his wife as himself, and let each wife see that she respects her husband. There's a command for husbands to love their wives. There's a command for wives to respect their husbands. Men and women are different. They're uniquely different. I mean, even from the beginning of creation, a woman was taken out of man. The man was taken out of dirt. That's why men are dirt bags, every one of us. <laughs> We're uniquely different, but we need each other. We complement one another. That's God's design from the beginning of creation. He makes pairs in many different ways. All and, up and throughout the animal kingdom, and you, know, you think even land and sea, sun, the moon, male and female. That's the way God has designed people for human flourishing. So male and female is God's design for holy matrimony. Uh, and a second idea this morning is that a marriage is to form a new family, a new nuclear family. You know, I don't like this idea necessarily. It makes me cry when I think about the idea of, but when you do a, a Christian wedding, one of the things you do, the, the father walks the bride down to the front of the altar, right? And what does the pastor say? Who gives, who gives this bride, right, away? What you do is essentially in a Christian marriage is you, the father uh, gives the daughter away to another man, to be the authority, in a sense, of a new family. So as parents, that's something that's good for us to think about. Our, our, we're stewards for a temporary time preparing our kids to start a new family, to be, to be fruitful. The two become this new family, and it's a new season. We're in a season now. Maybe you have a young kids at home. That's a, a season we're in now. There will be a future season. But it challenges us as parents to think about how we're raising our kids to one day go, right? A third idea this morning, a marriage is to hold fast together, cleave together. I mean, I asked Teresa, I was like, what are some hard things that we've gotten through together, right? And she's like, I mean, how, we, can I name one? There's hundreds, right? Like, how many things have we been through where we've gotten through this together? But God help us not to live our marriages. For those who you are married, to just live separately, and that's what can so easily happen. If if she's not going to respect me, you know what? I'm not even going to talk to her about it. I'm going to stonewall her completely. I'm going to have separate bedrooms, and we're going to live. I'm not going to talk to her about anything, and we're just going to live separate lives. That's a temptation. For you, not for me. It's not a temptation for me <laughs> to stonewall my beautiful wife. The idea is we hold fast together. You think of two trees or two plants. You put them in one pot together. They grow together to become one. You think of families who have separate bedrooms and separate everything. God desires that we pray together, that we sync up together as husband and wife, that we get through this together, that you get through this season. Especially you raising kids right now. You're in this together. Pray together. You know, Teresa and I, uh, we had, we've had our days of rocky uh, times, right? The one thing we've learned is to get through things together. Today, we, you know, these days we pray together more than we, I think we ever have. And we, we need to grow in that even more. We've had our times in the past, even as a church. You guys know I've confessed publicly that, you know, I've had my moments of yelling and I can't be doing that. The elders, I've even faced church discipline. I can't be a pastor of a church if I'm yelling at my wife, right? I yell at you guys, right? <laughs> Not her. And we deal with that. You know, we confess our sins publicly. We get help when we need to. But a fourth idea is that a marriage is a sacred and lifelong covenant. We don't have time to go into the sacred, but it's just that you and her, there's no other parties involved, right? But it's lifelong. When a Christian couple gets married, they're saying, I do forever, and they, it's a serious thing. It's not to be entered into flippantly. 
This is a covenant, a covenant agreement between two people. It's a lifelong covenant. You know, sadly, the divorce is just as common amongst Christian people, and it shouldn't be. You know, I know statistics don't always, you can't always get the full, you know, truth behind statistics, but statistically, Christians get married, uh, get divorced just as fast as unbelievers. I did see evangelicals have a, a little better track record, but 34% of Protestants in general have been divorced, and 30% of atheists have been divorced. As Christian people, let's set a new track record, even as we raise up the next generation to step into marriage seriously, right? Prepared. But God calls us to hang in there, to have loyal, steadfast love. I mean, can you imagine if Christ turned His back on us? That's the idea. This love. The love that's mentioned here is not based on feelings. Christ doesn't love you because you're lovable, right? That's the idea, is that we continue to love. Husbands, continue to love your wife even on a day where you guys aren't getting along or where she's jumping on the air hose of your, you know, of disrespect. That comes from the book Love and Respect. You're just totally deflated because she's been disrespecting you and she's been saying that again and she's, or whatever. We continue to love. Wives, same thing. Continue to respect even when he's acting unloving you know this idea is illustrated in in a story in the old testament hosea i don't know if you know the story of hosea and gomer gomer represents israel hosea represents god in the story and gomer was of questionable character by all means and god calls hosea to marry gomer and um, gomer ends up the wife ends up uh, committing adultery multiple times And God says, continue to love her, right? And Gomer eventually finds herself in slavery and bondage. Hosea goes and rescues her. And it's a picture that God continues to love Israel, even though Israel prostitutes herself with other gods. That's a radical love, isn't it? That's God's love for you. It's not because he feels love necessarily it's because by volitional choice he chooses an object and he loves that object despite feelings that's the idea of covenant love you know some of the things we're going to get into in the marriage uh in the the couple's cohort is that idea from love and respect right some of you guys maybe you're here and your marriage is in the crazy cycle right you're like if this doesn't stop it's got to end and it's like the crazy cycle comes from Emerson Egerich in his book, uh, Love and Respect. And it's like when she acts, uh, when she does something that's disrespectful, then the husband acts unloving. You know, uh, d- the husband acts unloving. And when he does something unloving, she acts disrespectful. And it's this crazy cycle. You know, the beautiful thing is that there is an energizing cycle. Right? And it's, it's that hesed, uh, steadfast love is that kind of love that says, you know what, even though she's being disrespectful right now, I'm going to continue to love, and I'm going to do what I can to act loving, even when I feel disrespected, and vice versa. When she feels unloved, you stop the crazy cycle. Be the bigger person, right, who continues to act respectfully. Think of the, you know, guys, what does it mean to make her feel loved, right? Book of, like, five love languages. Just aim for all five. You may not know what her love language is. Just try all five, you know? (laughs) I don't think we all have just, just one. I don't think we all have just one, personally. You know, some of your marriages, you're aiming for phileo type love, friendship love. Like, I don't feel it anymore. Listen, sometimes you're not going to feel it. That, those feelings of eros, for whatever reason, Greek only has, has like four words for love. English has one. And we're, you know, our philosophy of marriage is that we want to be feeling, uh, feelings of eros love and, uh, you know, phileo love well she's not my friend anymore or whatever no that's not the kind of love god's love is loyal hesed in the hebrew agape in the greek right it stays it remains despite feelings sometimes she's your soulmate sometimes she's your cellmate ken graves said that one 
a fifth idea. That's your marriage. That's not mine. Mine's always my soulmate. I told you. Fifth, a marriage is to be fruitful and multiply, right? That's God's uh, picture uh, for marriage. Marriage is not to make you happy, right? That's, you know, sort of existential philosophy. As a Christian, we have different philosophies of marriage. A marriage, the purposes of marriage is not to just, you know, satisfy your deepest longings for love. That's what God does, right? A marriage is a support structure for the flourishing of human uh, of, of society. That's why sometimes it's hard and we hang in there for the sake of kids, for the sake of the support system of family. A Christian marriage is to be fruitful and multiply. If you can't have physical kids, then we also have spiritual kids, right? You know, going on here, a deeper dive into some of these uh, ideas. I want to speak to some people here this morning. First, husbands, men. You know, this text in Mark is primarily directed to men. They were hardening their hearts and divorcing their wives for any and no reason. Husbands, if you're a husband here this morning and you're married and your heart is hardened and you've been stonewalling your wife, repent. Love her unconditionally, right? Even when she's not respecting you or if, you know, you're in a storm and you're like, she's not the wind in your sail like you had hoped or there's you know, she's not doing what you expected or whatever. You love her anyways. You hang in there. And you continue to make her feel loved. To love your wife unconditionally is the way God loves you. You stay married, right? Even if she's sinning against you, disrespecting you, love her unconditionally. God continues to love His bride. You may feel completely deflated. That's one of the reasons we want to do this couples cohort. Teresa and I want to share some of the things that have helped us. We believe, we know that God's redeeming grace is possible to, to, to help any marriage, to save any marriage. You know, wives, so husbands, continue to love your wife unconditionally. Wives, respect your husbands, even if he's not a, a believer and is a sorry husband. Learn what it means to be respectful. The command in Ephesians is not for, husband, for wives to love your husbands. For whatever reason, I, don't, I think it's more natural for women to continue to love, but then lack respect, right? Wives, respect your husbands. Learn what it means to make him feel respected. You want to stop the crazy cycle? You want to feel loved again? You want to kind of fan the flames of that love and get back to some little bit phileo, friendship, laughing together? Work on what it means to respect your husband. You know, even those married to unbelievers, you know, 1 Peter 3 calls you as a, if you're a wife married to an unbelieving husband, the Bible calls you to win him over with respect. You know, let your adorning be the hidden person of the heart, the imperishable beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit. You're not going to win him over by yelling at him. Right? Get other men involved. I understand that. I mean, the idea of chauvinism. I've struggled with chauvinism a lot in my life. And it's taken a lot of, and I'm not saying I'm completely free of it. <laughs> right? Right? <laughs> But get other men involved. If you have a husband that's a sorry husband, drag him to church. We have a, a church that has a lot of strong men in, a, in, a, in our church. And you get him involved in Brothers Breakfast, and you get involved with, uh, in a, in plugged into the church, God is going to do a work in your marriage the more you get plugged in, especially for the men and the women. Same thing. Parents, prepare your kids for marriage in a Christian way, a godly way, right? To step in, to, to one day leave your family and to go form a new family. Like men, tra raise your sons. And this, I'm not just talking about sex, right? Like, I don't think it's always the best thing just to uh, get married when you're 18 so you don't have sex outside of marriage. No, how about we teach self-control first, right? <laughs> get your act together so that you can leave and provide, speaking to the boys, right? Prepare to be able to provide for your family. 
And as men, we raise our sons. You raise your sons to do this. Have self-control. To begin to one day to prepare and to, to go into marriage successfully in God's will. You know, Symbus is the program we use that for premarital, premarital counseling. It's saving your marriage before it starts is what it stands for. And they kinda, you take this, uh, uh, basically you take a, a survey, both hus- uh, husband and wife, and it gives you the marriage momentum. Does this couple have momentum? This is only useful to a certain extent, but couples that have the highest momentum and the highest success rate are those who are obviously Christian believers, but who go into marriage at age 25 and older. Again, I didn't do that. I'm not saying it's that way with everyone. If you're married younger, it's okay. But that's just the idea. We can teach our Christian kids self-control and get them prepared to then leave the house, to pay your own bills, (laughs) and go and start a new family, right? Singles. To serve the family of God, especially abandoned children. You know, it's, I, I read a, I've read a statistic. One third of kids in America don't know their names of their grandparents. Did you know that? I mean, you think about how divorce has ravaged our country and our nation. That's been Satan's ploy. You get rid of the nuclear family, you, you weaken the entire country. You know, as single people, one of the things that you can do is serve children, especially, and I love that our church reaches out to children, you know, that aren't in the church. But singles, you can serve the Lord fully. You can serve children. You know, there's so few churches that offer ministries to reach out to children whose parents are not members of the church. We have a church that's like that, and I'm so proud. But Jesus commits children to the loving protection of his followers of disciples and then finally anyone anyone here this morning if you've been affected by divorce listen god never leaves you right he loves you unconditionally i realize that so many families like kids have had their dads leave and they feel they have they live with this feeling that of abandonment you don't have to feel that way with god's love for you he's never going to leave you he's never going to forsake you Maybe you've been a part of a marriage where your husband has left you or your wife has left you or you have these feelings. Listen, God loves you unconditionally. Be at peace. He's with you. He's strengthening you. He's guiding you. You know, if your marriage is struggling this morning, you please sign up for the couples cohort. We want to help you. Uh, there's other couples in the church. If you are, have a strong marriage, show up and, and help mentor uh, younger marriages. There's so many practical ways Uh, We can help one another. Hey, the band's going to come. We're going to share in communion this morning. It is a Sunday where we're going to celebrate both sacraments. We have communion this morning, and for those who are available, we're going to have baptism after, baptisms after church at the Carling's house. Uh, If you need directions to the Carling's house, we're going to have lunch, and we're going to have baptisms over there. Uh, Carling's are sitting right over here. You can ask them for their address. But um, as the band comes and as the ushers pass this out, we have gone back to these old trays. So please, as the tray comes by, grab the tray with one hand, grab the bread, then the cup, and pass the tray. I know we're still getting used to this idea again. And as you take the bread and, and cup, if you're, you don't have to if you're not a believer, but if you want to partake in communion with us, Just hold on to the bread and the cup this morning for a minute. Let's all take a moment, pray, search your hearts as they sing. The mystery of the cross I cannot comprehend. The agonies of Calvary. Perfect Holy One crushed your son. You drank the bitter cup for me. Your blood has washed away my sin. Jesus, thank you. The Father's wrath completely satisfied. Jesus, thank you. Once your
about the cross and we know there's no other way that we can be saved. Father, thank you for sending your son Jesus to come and to die a sacrificial death, taking our place, and dying on the cross for us so that we can be forgiven of sin and made right with you, God. The Bible says that the Lord Jesus, on the night that he was betrayed, he took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's all share in the bread together. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Let's all share in the cup together. Thank you, Lord. Let's all stand together. If you need prayer for any reason, uh, we're available, the elders are available, but um, let's sing this chorus one last time together. Your blood has washed away my sin. Jesus, thank you. The Father's wrath completely satisfied. Jesus, thank you. Once your enemy, now seated at your table, Jesus, thank you. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May he make his face shine upon you and give you peace and joy as you walk with him this week. In Jesus' name, amen. You guys are dismissed.